Um, so with that, why don't I introduce Darcy? So Darcy Goto is an air pollution specialist with California Air Resources Board. Um, she's a graduate of California State University, Sacramento, with a bachelor's degree in environmental science and a minor in geography. She began her career at ARB working in the inorganics laboratory section, supporting the PM2.5 mass and PM2.5 speciation programs. She currently works in the quality management section of ARB, and her primary responsibilities include writing and reviewing quality management documents, conducting technical system audits, and acting as a liaison between ARB and air districts um, within ARB's PQAO. Darcy has also participated in various events, including Cal EPA's Earth Day, the State Scientist Day, and the Air and Waste Management Association's Air Quality Measure Measurement Methods and Technology Conference. So with that, Darcy. Morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? Okay. I see everybody stayed out of this uh, front little splash zone for us nervous speakers, smart thinking. <laughs> um, thanks, Gwen, for the introduction. Again, my name is Darcy Goto, and I will be discussing the PQAO from ARB's perspective. And my presentation is titled, Getting to Know the Air Resources Board's PQAO. So, oh, there we go. Um, so as a brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about today, um, I'm going to kick it off with a brief discussion of air quality in California. I will go over ARB's PQAO structure. I'll discuss the challenges and benefits of a PQAO, and also roles and responsibilities. So let me just jump right in. So California faces many challenges when it comes to air quality, mostly because it has some of the worst air quality in the United States, especially in larger cities such as Sacramento and Los Angeles. So what are the causes of this poor air quality, do you ask? Well, the zombie apocalypse, of course. <laughs> okay, so kidding about the apocalypse, of course. Um, this horde of zombies coming at you um, represents California's large population. We have over 33 million humans living in California, and we aren't zombies yet, and hopefully we won't be after this training, but no promises. <laughs> but as humans, we do produce all sorts of air pollution from sources such as automobiles, industry, wood burning, and agriculture. California's topography is also perfect for trapping and forming air pollutants. Most of California's largest cities, such as Sacramento, Bakersfield, and Los An Angeles, are built in valleys surrounded by mountains. These areas are natural bowls which trap pollution and prevent air from circulating. But luckily, there are multiple organizations playing a role in monitoring and regulating air quality in California including the Environmental Protection Agency, the Air Resources Board, and 35 air districts throughout California. But with this many organizations participating in air quality, miscommunication is bound to occur, which can compromise the integrity of the data produced. This begs the need for quality assurance oversight, which brings us to the Primary Quality Assurance Organization, once again, <laughs> or PQAO. So Gwen gave us kind of the nitty gritty definition of the PQAO, but as a quick recap, a PQAO is a monitoring organization or group of monitoring organizations that collects data for regulatory purposes. A PQAO provides quality assurance oversight and ensures that the data produced is consistent, high quality, and defensible. So as you all know by now, the Air Resources Board is a PQAO. It consists of all monitoring organizations within California, with the exception of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, the South Coast Air Quality Management District, and the San Diego County Air Pollution Contro Control District. And these uh, three organizations are their own PQAOs. The ARB PQAO also doesn't include tribal monitoring organizations because they collect non-regulatory data that is not submitted to the Air Quality System or AQS database. So the ARB PQAO contains or oversees 32 air districts who then operate over 180 air monitoring sites. All right. So this is a map of the PQAOs in California. We have the Bay Area in yellow, the San Diego PQAO in orange, the South Coast in pink, and the Air Resources Board in blue. And as you can see, ARB's PQAO covers the largest geographical area 
we have districts um, ranging from the Oregon border to the Mexican border and from the Pacific Coast to the Arizona and Nevada border. So this is an org chart that um, illustrates the quality assurance oversight within California. EPA Region 9 oversees the four PQAOs. And then ARB is unique because it provides oversight over multiple air districts who then operate their air monitoring sites. And two of the 32 monitoring organizations that I have up here are the North Coast Unified Air Quality Management District, who operate sites such, such as Crescent City and Eureka, and then the Mojave Desert Air Quality Management District, who, you're, who you are going to be hearing from next. They operate sites such as Victorville and Trona. Oh, and there's also kind of a dotted line relationship between the four PQAOs. We collaborate on items such as training and quality management documents. So, ARB faces many challenges as a PQAO. Um, first off, it contains a large number of monitoring organizations covering a large geographical area. This can make communication and collaborative partnerships difficult. It's also a new organization or idea as of uh, 2006, so we're still working towards a clear understanding of staff response, or as of the expectations of both ARB and districts as part of the PQAO. There's also varying resources amongst districts, and staff responsibilities may differ between larger and smaller districts. Um, so some districts are large enough to have multiple field operators, a laboratory staff, a QA staff, maybe a planning staff, whereas other districts have one staff member who is the site operator, a laboratory chemist, and one of the data reviewers. So they might wear multiple hats. And sorry, I made this slide before I knew the no hat rule, so I apologize for this guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> but despite the challenges that ARB's PQAO faces, um, uh, the unification of organizations strengthens air monitoring programs through improved communication, consistency of practices and, pr practices and procedures, and time and money savings through shared resources. That football's coming back. <laughs> um, so one of these shared resources is quality management documents. Um, federal regulations require a PQAO to operate under various documents, including a quality management plan, a quality assurance project plan, and standard operating procedures. Districts within the PQAO have the option of either utilizing existing documents developed by ARB or districts or developing their own for their appropriate programs. Districts can also choose to write an addendum to existing documents if there are only minor differences with the procedures. So to distribute quality management documents, ARB developed a quality management document repository table which is available on ARB's Quality Assurance website. Ugh, I think we need to count the number of times that I'm saying quality assurance because I feel like it's a lot. <laughs> anyway, the portion of the table that I have on screen, it's a small portion, portion of our gaseous criteria pollutants table. Um, we have the monitoring organizations listed on the left column and the pollutants listed across the top. And within the table shows the documents that are utilized by the organizations, as well as the status of the documents, whether they're pending or finalized. Um, and documents that are finalized or almost finalized have live links directly to the SOP, so users can use, easily access and utilize what is available. So, show of hands, who here has been through an audit within their organization? I'm expecting to see lots of them, <laughs> okay. So almost everyone in this room has been through an audit once, twice, or many times within their organization. And audits, although they may seem like a pain sometimes, they do help to ensure the quality of the data produced. The Air Resources Board conducts performance audits, which are independent assessments in which monitoring site instrument results are compared to audit equipment results. Um, these audits ensure that instrument results in siting meet ARB and EPA acceptance criteria. ARB also conducts technical system audits, which are a comprehensive review of procedures. Uh, these audits include an on-site visit in which documents used, field operations, and data management procedures are reviewed. A formal report it, with recommended corrective actions is provided to the district following the on-site visit. So, ARB also provides tools for documenting corrective actions. Documenting air monitoring issues and corrective actions is important because it helps to ensure the defensibility of your data. 
ARB issues AQDA, or Air Quality Data Action, or AQDA, requests. Um, these are issued when performance audit results do not meet acceptance criteria. Um, they document the issues discovered during the audit and requires corrective action by the site operator. And I'm coming to those cans, Dawn. <laughs> ARB also uses the corrective action notification or CAN process. Um, this is a new process that was identified by ARB and the US EPA as an essential component for documenting and correcting air quality issues that may impact data quality. Unlike AQDAs, which are primarily issued during audits, a CAN may be initiated at any point during the air monitoring process and by any individual involved with the data generated. ARB maintains a database of the CANs and will ensure that the issues are resolved. So this is a real life example in which the CAN form was used. Um, so we had an issue where a site operator had gone out to their site and found that their wind direction vane had fused to the sensor. And while troubleshooting, the sensor had become misaligned. So the corrective action that was performed was that the operator installed and calibrated a new sensor and flagged the data in AQS for the week that the sensor was offline. And the resolution was that electrical tape was used to cover the sensor, or I'm sorry, cover the fused area and prevent reoccurrence. So it was important that a CAN form was used in this situation because appropriate individuals were notified of the situation. And also, if the flag data in AQS is ever questioned, the site operator has proper documentation to show what the issue was, the actions taken, and the resolution. So. ARB also has various tools for communication and networking within the PQAO. We have our updated quality assurance website, which we'll be getting, or you guys will be getting a tour of that in a later presentation. Um, ARB districts and EPA also uh, participate in monthly conference calls hosted by the Air Monitoring Committee of CAPCOA. Um, these calls are a good opportunity for interagency discussion on various air monitoring related topics. We also have direct communication with districts through um, various work groups, conference calls, and the PQAO email listserv. And speaking of work groups, just to give a quick, another quick shout out to our curriculum advisory committee who helped us develop this training. Thank you guys. <laughs> um, we also have various training opportunities such as this one, which are great for networking and increasing staff knowledge. Um, each district also has a designated PQAO contact who they can get in touch with for questions and providing information. So, being a part of the PQAO can save districts time and money through all of these shared resources. And as Gwen mentioned, being a part of the PQAO is a federal requirement for collecting data for regulatory purposes. And all PQAOs are required to meet those five common factors which you've all heard so much about. So based on these common factors, a lot is required of a PQAO. As a further examination of the benefits of being a part of the ARB PQAO, um, here's a side-by-side -side comparison of what is required of an independent PQAO versus what the ARB PQAO can provide. So as an independent PQAO, you must develop quality management documents, you must have calibration facilities and standards, you must have independent audit services, and meet collocated monitoring requirements. So not only do these things take time and staff resources, it's also costly. Calibrations from outside vendors could be anywhere from two to $400 an instrument. Independent audits can be over $2,000 each, and collocated monitoring requirements means the purchase of duplicated instrumentation. However, ARBs um, within our PQAO, we provide quality management documents for utilization. We provide calibration facilities through, for free through our standards laboratory. We conduct those audits, and collocated monitoring requirements are PQAO-wide, which reduces this uh, requirement on the individual organizations. So, as mentioned earlier, one of the challenges that ARB's PQAO faces is that each of the districts has differing responsibilities. In 2011, EPA conducted a technical system audit on ARB, and one of their biggest findings was that dis er, district and ARB responsibilities within the PQAO were cloudy, such as who is responsible for the calibration of standards? What about for data validation? And who the heck is writing the SOPs? <laughs> um, so EPA's recommended corrective action 
was that ARB needs to implement a mechanism for formalizing these responsibilities. Which brings us to the Roles and Responsibilities, or R&R documents. These documents establish the roles and responsibilities of both ARB and districts as a part of the PQAO. They uh, collaboratively address the five common factors and are individualized for each of the districts. They're also considered living documents and may change as ARB and district responsibilities change. So here's an example of ARB and district responsibilities and how they collaboratively address one of the five common factors, which is oversight by a common quality assurance organization. ARB's responsibilities include conducting audits, issuing AQDAs, maintaining the CAN database, and providing procedures and criteria for data validation. Whereas the district responsibilities are to participate in these audits, resolve AQDAs, utilize the CAN process or an approved alternative for documenting corrective actions, and utilizing ARB procedures and criteria for data validation or an ARB approved alternative for procedures. And more district responsibilities will be discussed in our next presentation. So. So once ARB and districts understand each of their roles and responsibilities within the PQAO, we can start thinking of R&Rs not as roles and responsibilities, but as rest and relaxation. <laughs> Don't you all wish you were there? I, I know I do. <laughs> so whether your district is its own PQAO or you are part of the ARB PQAO, a PQAO is essential for producing high quality, consistent defensible data, which is achieved through streamlined activities, effective utilization of resources, and consistency of practices and procedures. So I'm now going to conclude with a football analogy. I told you that football was coming back. Um, <laughs> and this kind of sums up the relationship of ARB and the districts. So within ARB's PQAO, we like to think that ARB and the districts are kind of on the same team. Uh, ARB is the quarterback, and we provide oversight for the team and pass those resources along to the districts, and hopefully we'll all score a touchdown for data quality. <laughs> so that's all I have, contact information. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions for me? Don, did I answer your can question slightly? <laughs> How many have there has over a hundred. I'm looking at Greg, who maintains our uh, database. Ninety, okay. So quite a few, and just for all sorts of different reasons. And I think we're still trying to pin down, you know, what what we're using for a can and what shouldn't be used as a can. And it's all kind of a work in progress. But I think it's still great for documenting our issues. So. Thank you, Mike. Um, Ken? Yeah, so Mike presentation. In Thank your, you. Uh, repository for CAN, you mentioned that in your example that you can view the do document deposit and whether it's available to everybody in the PQA? Um, not currently. We um, don't have them available online so that everybody can see them. It's kind of just a little database for our use, but that actually might be a good idea to kind of put them out there and that way everyone can have examples of, you know, what they're being used. <laughs> initiate can and when it's not appropriate because I usually get questions from the districts like do we have to use a can to document 
our automated calibration every month or yeah. so? Or, or does it have to be a systemic issue, like Mike mentioned, where it happens for many days or weeks or um, at an end before they utilize the can or not? Right, and um, we do have an SOP, um, although we do, um, within the SOP, we kind of state that it's to the discretion of the site operator, and it's a little vague. It's just yeah. basically any issue that may impact data quality, whether it's, you know, for one day or multiple days. So we just kind of like to leave it up to you guys since you're the initiators and taking ownership of the, the data. But hopefully, you know, once we get some more examples and get it going, we can have more examples of when it should be used. And Maybe you could... Uh revamp the SOP and say be more be more discreet saying use a can only for these instances. Right. Rather right. than saying it's up to you guys because they'll be calling me and say, hey, it's can appropriate. Is this the or reason not? is that yeah, yeah. Is <laughs> right. Up to issue a can or not. And yeah. I can't provide the answer. I'll be saying look at the SOP. But the right. SOP says back it's like a circle thing. It's like yeah. up to the discretion <laughs> of the initiator. Right, yeah. So maybe that can be definitely. more just uh, explicit on the SOP, I guess. Right, yeah, and that's that's a good point. And yeah, maybe we could include some more examples there because you're right, it can be frustrating to go through that endless loop. So, <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Um, Carl? Hi, um, Hi. I want to recap a little bit, a little bit of confusion that I am having on the difference between AQDA and a CAN. Sure. If I'm understanding right, AQDA is only issued when an audit is occurring and it, it's basically affecting data, uh, justifying the, the, that data or nullifying it. The corrective action notice is uh, physically changing something or changing a procedure. But one of the things that you said was that a CAN can be initiated by anyone, not just a QA staff. Right. Can you give me examples where non-QA staff, what type of CAN would be issued because that's the part I don't get. Uh, why? Who else would initiate a CAN, and uh, how how would that be? Um, you mean aside from the QA personnel? Who the, is, other than the right. QA. Uh, um, actually, most of the CANs that we have gotten, and with the example that I gave, they've actually been initiated by site operators who have actually you know gone out to their site, seen an issue, and then use the CAN form to document what the issue was. And, you know, so it was kind of used um, that, with that to notify their managers. So it is actually more or less, or what we've seen have, has been more used by the operators. So whereas the AQDAs, you're right, are, those are primi primarily issued during the audits and by our uh, audit team, whereas um, the CANs can be initiated by anyone involved. So and thank you for all the questions. It's great to see everyone's opinion on the CAN process and what we can improve, so thanks.